Welcome to The Table Podcast, where we discuss issues of God and culture. Brought to you by Dallas Theological Seminary. Welcome to The Table, where we discuss issues of God and culture, and today our topic is the historical Adam. And we're going to be discussing this with Dr. Richard Averbeck, who is professor of Old Testament at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School and also uh, is director of the doctoral program there. And we're going to be looking at the background of uh, the story of creation as well as the book of Genesis together. Uh, uh, Dr. Averbeck has expertise in uh, ancient Near Eastern literature, and so we figured since uh, most of your neighbors don't have that kind of expertise that we'd bring him in and, and let him discuss this uh, topic with us. As people are aware of, the nature of historical Adam is much discussed and debated today, and understanding where uh, the stories of creation fit in the ancient Near East is part of the conversation that we need to have when we look at these opening chapters in the book of Genesis. So I can't think of a better person to have with us than than. Dr. Richard Averbeck. So welcome, Dick. We're glad you could be with us today, and we really do appreciate you taking the time to discuss this with us. Thank you, Daryl. I'm looking forward to it. Well, let me just dive right in. Let's talk a little bit about uh, about creation stories in the ancient Near East. Uh, why don't you uh, mention to us uh, some of the key accounts that we have and how they approach this issue, and then we'll turn our attention to how the story of Genesis is like or unlike those accounts. Probably the most well-known one uh, is from Babylonia. It's called Enuma Elish, which means went on high. It's a, it's a starting uh, with a, a watery abyss and talks us through uh, the creation uh, from First of the various gods of that society, but also then into the battle that leads to the creation of the world and humanity and, and so on. It's got all sorts of different motifs in it. Some of them um, are similar to the Bible, like starting with the deep, dark, watery abyss, and others are very different. For example, in Genesis 1, there's no battle going on there. So uh, there's uh, quite a number of stories from Babylonia from early on, long before uh, the 7th century B.C., way back uh, into the 3rd millennium B.C. We have sources for creation and the creation not only of the gods, but also of humanity and, and of the world. Uh, there's a Sumerian story as well that has both creation of man and the flood in the same story, uh, much like we have in Genesis 1 through 11. And then also from Egypt, we have uh, quite a number of stories from different temple contexts, therefore from different perspective of different gods in terms of how creation was done. There we have uh, various kinds of concepts that uh, are very different from the Bible on the one hand, but then there are certain similarities like in one of them, we do have a God speaking, and the creation happens. But then you have all sorts of other kinds of sometimes people are made out of the tears of the God or various things along uh, that line. So there's there's uh, lots of different kinds of stories from the ancient Near East. And then related stories like um, from Ugarit in northern uh, Lebanon, uh, which we we have text from there and talks about Baal and how he's related to nature and that affects how they would understand in the ancient Near Eastern world how the world is put together and how it works and that then finds some of the motifs uh, associated with that coming on into uh, uh, background concepts that the ancient Israelites would have been familiar with because the ancient Israelites were ancient Near Easterners too. Okay, so so we've got these stories. Do we have do the stories take on the character like we see in Genesis of a of a single family at the star? Or are they about uh, a creation of humanity in general? How how does how is that part of the story told? Yeah, it's it, it's more or less about the uh, how mankind was created 
so that man could replace uh, lower gods who were responsible for working and therefore feeding the gods. And so man was created so that the lower gods don't have to work because they were complaining about the hard work. Oh, wow. And so it's, it's the first union movement. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yes. So we have those kinds of stories. We have the story of a dapa, of a particular primeval person. We have different kinds of things. We have a, a Babylonian Noah-type stories, uh, you know, with, with concepts of the flood and survival from the flood. And uh, these early chapters of Genesis have a lot of um, different kinds of uh, connections to things that were understood in the ancient Near East. And, and in the Bible, what God is doing is he's connecting to them in their world, but also taking them places they've never gone before in their understanding of who God is and how the world came into being. So the way in which Genesis tells the story would not be unfamiliar to someone if they were familiar with some of these other accounts that exist in the ancient Near East, at least in terms of some of the motifs. Yeah, there would be a lot of things that would very, be very simple. One of the things that would be very similar, uh, like the beginning with a watery deep uh, and so on like that. But uh, they're also, in the ancient Near Eastern context, you have to have not only the creation of the world and so on, but before that, the creation of the gods. So you have theogony, creation of, of the gods. And that, uh, that is something that the Bible just... Uh, stamps out completely from any kind of concept. In the beginning, God created. So, so the, we have the uncreated God uh, as opposed to creation of gods in the ancient Near East. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Now, uh, sometimes it's said that these uh, accounts uh, outside the New Testament or outside, sorry, the Old Testament. Um, are dealing with uh, explaining the origin of things. They are a certain kind of story that 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 uh, etiology, which which explains why certain things happen. Is that is that also what's going on? In those stories, yes. There's there's quite a lot of explaining. How did this come into being? How did that come into being? Uh, how did how was it arranged in such a way that the world actually works? Uh, things along that line are very common in these stories. And in the Bible, a big part of what God's concern is, is to explain to us our world. Who are we? You know, where do we come from? How do we fit into what's all around us? And uh, what place are we supposed to take in it as far as God is concerned? So these stories frame uh, the creation of humanity, explain where humanity fits in relationship to the gods. Uh, in relationship to the responsibilities that they have on Earth? Is, is that what's going on in those stories? Yes, and uh, they, they do that in such a way that they make it very clear that, uh, that, that man has this particular position. One of the things that really stands out about the creation story in Genesis in that regard is that we're created in the image and likeness of God, not just kings in our culture, not just the, the elite or anything, but all of humanity is created as God's image and likeness and is meant to reflect who He is in the world and to handle the world in a way that's pleasing to Him. We're put in charge. So there's a, there is an exalted role for, for all people in the, in the way the creation works in, in the Old Testament. Yes, and that's that's really does stand out. We do have uh, quite a number of uh, um, accounts that that talk about kings being the image of God and so on. But um, the thing that stands out in uh, the Bible is that people, just common people, are put here to be God's statue, so to speak, in the world. Those who stand here for Him. Now, this is a poor question, but I'm going to ask it anyway because it's kind of a catch-all. What, In terms of the background, is there anything that we haven't mentioned or touched on yet that's relevant to Genesis that you think we should be aware of before we turn our attention to the book of Genesis? Um, maybe I should mention that in a lot of the ancient Near Eastern accounts, we mentioned this briefly, uh, there are you, you do creation by doing battle between the gods in various ways. It's, it's got a name for it, uh, uh, the, the, the chaos battle, 
okay? Battle with chaos. So you can bring order out of this by doing battle with this God of chaos and so on. And there are reflections in the Bible of God being the one who can defeat all this chaos and so on, sometimes in relation to creation. But in Genesis, what we have is a account that makes it very clear that God doesn't have to do any battle here at all. God speaks and it happens. And things like the sun and the moon and the stars that are gods in the ancient Near Eastern world, uh, they're just called the, the big light and the little light. They're, they're, they're even demoted. They don't have, even have the name of Shamash or something like that, the name of the sun god. So it's, it's very clearly telling us these things that are so commonly thought of as gods are not, and there is no God that can stand against our God. Now, when you talk about this battle uh, motif, uh, in the Old Testament, is that reflected in the, in the figure known as Leviathan? Is that, is that what you're alluding to in, in, in terms of potential connection, or is that something else? That is one of the names. Also, Rahab, different, different names are used for this, but like in Isaiah 27, 1, the little apocalypse of Isaiah looks forward to the great final defeat of this great Leviathan, this evil monster. Whereas in Psalm 74 and other places, it refers to this Leviathan who's been defeated in the olden days. It's a way of talking about how God is the one who defeats evil and stands against those forces in the world. You know, one of the, one of the problems that you run into in the early chapters of Genesis is understanding uh, how evil is even present. Uh, when we come to Genesis three and uh, and and where it has come from, and the, and there really is in the in the unwinding of the Genesis story, uh, no backdrop for where this has come from. It just it it just comes in, if you will. Um, uh, in your own mind, do you connect uh, the Leviathan uh, imagery with the backdrop to explaining why we have evil in Genesis 3? How should we connect those things biblically before we turn to Genesis? Uh, this is something that I've been working on for a long time. And uh, what I think is happening in Genesis, we, in creation, we don't have a battle between God and the great monster, the, the chaos monster. What happens is um, in the Old Testament and in Genesis 1 through 4, uh, the battle doesn't begin at creation. It begins with the fall. Uh, that, that is the battle of the ages that's encountered there. And the serpent uh, attacks the image of God, us, and in so doing, he attacks God. And so the battle uh, that we're in the middle of is this force of chaos in the world, sin, disruption, the kind of thing of corruption that we are and, and that, that, that is a big part of who we are and that we struggle with in the world. So I think what happens in the earlier chapters of Genesis is that uh, the Bible does something very different from what the ancient Near Eastern world does. It takes this battle and puts it right in our lap uh, and it says the battle came through the temptation and the fall and now that battle is the great battle of the ages. And it's very interesting that if you go to the book of Revelation, chapter 12, it talks about this woman who's about to have a child, and it has all of these uh, this imagery in it from the Old Testament, and how this great one is the dragon of old, this great evil one, and he gets defeated by this child who rules the nations with a rod of iron, and so on. And it's really like what in Jewish circles we call a midrash, where it explains explains what's going on in the ultimate day by talking about how that great evil that began back then and that great evil one, that's all going to be destroyed and we're going to end up eventually in Revelation 21 and 22 with a new heaven and a new earth where that sort of corruption just does not exist. So this spiritual battle is really something that runs through the entirety of Scripture from start to finish. Yeah, we're, we're in the middle of a great big cosmic fray. It's a brawl. And we're the territory under dispute, you and I and everyone in this world, this, us as people, because we were created as God's image. And so the attack was upon God because it was an attack upon the image of God. And this is, ties into all sorts of things that we have from the world of the Old Testament, where if they made statues of a king or, or of a god, uh, especially of kings, what they would talk about at the end is curses on those who would do any damage uh, 
to that statue uh, and, and so on, or put their own name on it, or various things. And uh, the point uh, really is that uh, doing damage to this statue, us, is to be in a direct attack upon God himself. That's where the battle gets engaged. The battle starts in history, in Genesis 3, and it will be consummated in history. And, I, it in and I think if I've been listening to you carefully, that portrayal of the battle is a different kind of battle than the battle we're seeing in the ancient Near Eastern text, which is more, how can I say it, between the gods themselves in, in many ways. Is that right, or, or, or is humanity a part of that battle in the ancient Near Eastern background as well? Humanity is part of the battle because when they talk, say, there might be one particular god who's the good god. For example, in Canaan, Baal is considered good god. In the Old Testament, he's evil, <laughs> and, and he is. But uh, in the uh, in that Baal is defeating the great evil monster Leviathan in the Ugaritic material, and what happens is that uh, because he defeats Leviathan, there is fertility and therefore prosperity uh, in the world of mankind. So mankind is involved in relationship to the gods, uh, but the battle is on that divine level, on that level, and in a certain sense. Uh, there's there's a relationship to that with the great evil one, you know, the angelic powers and mm -hmm. so on. So so it's it's different, but there are some connections that helped I think the ancient Israelites understand who they were. In other words, God was speaking into their world in a way that really made sense, was true about what really happened, and was put in such a way that they could really get the point. They could really see the power of this great evil but the greater power of their great God. Now, um, this Leviathan figure, do you see that – what kind of a – I'm getting particular, very specific here. What kind of a beast is this? Is this a – is it a fish? And, you know, the, uh, we have the image of Revelation of a dragon. What, what, what are we looking at when we talk about Leviathan? Do we know? Yeah, we actually have quite a few descriptions. Uh, he's the great sea monster. And uh, he has multiple heads, according to Psalm 74. It's interesting, and, and these kinds of pictures come out in other literatures of the ancient Near East, too. There's a sense of this great evil power. People all over the world knew about evil. They knew about the corruption, and they faced it. All of us do, every day in our lives. And so what happens is that... Uh, in it, they, they had this picture of this great evil serpent. In fact, we have actually pictures of this great serpent with seven heads and we have multiple heads and sometimes seven and there's a battle going on and this is actually in ancient Near Eastern picture material, iconog iconography and in this material they will have like seven heads on this serpent and maybe three of them are hanging down dead and four of them are still striking out and uh, we actually have pictures of this sort of thing. <laughs> kind of the old form of the nine lives of the cat. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, um, I've got about five questions in my head. I'm trying to decide which one to ask next. Uh, the the when we think about this battle and the way in which it is portrayed in Scripture, uh, as you said, the opening of of Genesis, and I'm transitioning. The opening of Genesis is is much more tranquil, isn't it, uh, in comparison to the chaos of the battle that is a part of the creation in these other stories? We're starting in a slightly different place. Is that right? Yeah. One thing that's very clear from Genesis is that there's only one God, in the beginning God, and there's a deep, dark, watery abyss, but he doesn't do have to do any battle. He reshapes it by speaking. And, and and there is no battle that takes place. It's very tranquil, and yet we do have this spirit of God hovering over the waters, kind of as ready to do creative work. Now, uh, some people, when they come to these texts, and particularly in light of everything that we've been discussing in terms of ancient Near Eastern background, will apply the term myth to this material, and oftentimes what they mean by it is it's a, it, it's a story that has to do with, with explaining where things come from That's a, a, and those kinds of things, but it, but it really isn't um, history. It, it's something else. Um, help us sort out that discussion. Um, would, 
should we do we call this myth? Uh, does myth necessarily exclude history, or should we think of this as history? How do we how do we put that together? What kind of genre are we dealing with? This is one of those uh, very difficult areas because there's nothing wrong with the word myth being used in this, but it it gives a sense to people that this is fiction um, uh, because people think of myth as fiction, but ri- myth mythos really means a powerful story. It's it's something that's that really carries a lot of freight with it, and these accounts in Genesis really do. There's a lot there packed into small space, and uh, it, it's it's helping us to understand the big story of of the world and of life and of our existence and what happens uh, between us and so on. So. Uh, I don't have any problem using the term myth, but it's really easily misunderstood because people associate myth with fiction. And I do not mean when I talk about Genesis uh, on the level of this mythic story in terms of this really powerful story. I do not mean fiction. Yeah. So, so myth is our, our uh, what we call, what, the philosophical term is meta narrative. It's a big story about core elements of life. And we aren't making a comment necessarily in using the term about whether the story is, uh, if I can say it, real or not, or history or not. We're, we're not making a distinction by using that term. We're actually saying, no, one of the things that makes this a real, big, important, grand story, grand narrative, is the fact that it does reflect uh, reality. Is that right? Yeah. yeah it, fe- it affects the most important realities of our lives. Okay, let's turn our attention now to Genesis and uh, directly, and we've talked about the opening start. Let's talk a little bit about the structure of – well, well. let me bring up something that often comes up in, in this discussion that you hear if you turn on the television and people start to talk about the creation stories. I mean, one of the things that you hear is this discussion on the use of the term myth, which we've already talked about. But the second thing that you hear about that, that often comes up is the claim that the story in Genesis 1 and the story in Genesis 2 are two very different stories of creation, that they don't, that they, they don't connect. That, in fact, some people will say they're even written by, by different authors. So let's talk about the relationship of Genesis 1 and 2 before we turn to uh, any one, uh, one of those accounts. Well, th- there is um, a, an important shift between Genesis 1-1 through chapter 2, verse 3, and then there's a, an, a, 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 a particular expression, these are the generations of uh, the heavens and the earth, often translated, these are the accounts of the heavens and the earth. And it refers to what comes out of, what generates from what's already going before it. And so we have this whole cosmos, this whole universe in Genesis 1, 1 through 2, 3, and then Genesis 2, 4 goes on and really zeroes down into the world of humanity. There's an interesting thing that happens. In the first chapter, the name for God is Elohim. It's the broad name for the great God. Uh, Then what happens in chapter 2 is there's a shift. You still use the name Elohim, but along with it, the name Lord. Now, this is pronounced in Hebrew, Yahweh. Some people have pronounced it Jehovah, uh, but this is referring to Yahweh, the God of the Israelites, uh, in uh, Exodus when he delivered them from Egypt. And so uh, what happens is in Genesis 2 verse 4, going from Elohim in in the chapter 1 story, it moves to Yahweh Elohim and uses Yahweh Elohim throughout the account in chapter 2. And so what happens is the uh, writer, and I do take it to be Moses, okay? Mm -hmm. The writer is actually taking uh, and telling the people of Israel, who are the recipients of this material, this story, of this account, uh, he's telling them the Yahweh who is the God delivering you from Egypt is the same God who created all that we have, all that we're in the midst of here in this universe. What, what, and so, so it's really tying the history of Israel into, and the importance of Yahweh as the covenant God of Israel, into who he really is. And that's, he's the great creator God. 
Okay, now you ended kind of where I was going, which is the difference in between the two chapters then is that in Ch- Genesis 1 we're getting a look at, at, at Elohim, if I can say it this way, the sovereign creator God, the all-powerful God, the only God. Uh, in the context of the ancient Near East, that's a very important statement. And then in chapter 2 when we go to Yahweh Elohim, we're dealing with the personal covenant God who has relationship, and so this explains in part the shift between the grand creation in seven days that we get in Genesis 1 and the more personalized focus on the creation of Adam and Eve uh, as a development of being created in the image of God, but of, but in very personal and in very direct, in, in, if I can almost use this word, in, in, in fellowshipping terms almost. Is that is that a fair way to think about it? Very much. It really is what's going on, and because this name Yahweh brings that with it. And uh, so he combines the two names in a very, very significant way as we develop that. And then, of course, there are other things, too, that, that uh, really distinguish uh, chapter 2, 4, and following from chapter 1. So it's a little bit like well I've, there, let me before I forget this I'm going to forget it otherwise the name Yahweh of course is the name that we see when Moses uh, asked the question who should I tell them sent me uh, um, you know I'm going to have to I'm going to have to explain myself here uh, yeah. and justify uh, what I'm getting ready to ask the, God's people to do so who sent me is isn't this the name that we get isn't Yahweh the name that we get in the in the burning bush episode. Absolutely, yeah. That's the very name that is made clear there, that he's the one that is and he he will be with them. Okay. Uh, Now, let's, uh, again, thinking about uh, Genesis 1 in relationship to to Genesis 2. In Genesis 1, then, it's kind of like we've got the big picture. This is like a this is like a director of a movie, if I can make an analogy, where first we get the huge panorama and we get the big picture, and then we zero in and we we kind of zoom in with a close-up and we take a look at a particular feature of what's gone on in the big sweep. So Genesis 1's the big sweep, and Genesis 2 is the zeroing in with the camera and zooming in, if you will, and saying, let's talk about this one aspect of this creation. Is that what's going on between those two chapters? Yes. Yeah, that's the general idea. And it's it's developing, really, if you look at the two that the chapter two account is really a, a, a much fuller down to right in the soil kind of development of day six in, uh, in chapter one. Okay, now let's go back to chapter one because obviously another important feature of chapter one is, is this seven day element. And let's talk about that in relationship to the idea of the Sabbath. Uh, the seven days and the day, of course, the six days of labor and the one day of rest. Uh, in, in Genesis 1, one of the things that's happening in Genesis 1, we talked about etiology again, uh, is explaining um, the creation and how the Sabbath is a mirror of what happened in the creation. Uh, um, how, do we, how do we think about that? How, does, how did Jewish theology think about that in reading Genesis? Well, the word day is the word use the regular word that's used for day and the fact that we have evening and morning suggests that we're talking about the the regular day evening and morning at the end of these days uh, and so on one of the things that stands out is that there is this there's good reason to believe that these are actual literal days um, uh, but on the other hand uh, there's also this pattern in scripture the six seven pattern uh, where they use a lot of sixes with seven or seven patterns like even in uh, Proverbs chapter six there's six things the Lord hates yes seven uh, there, there's these various kinds of combinations of uh, six and seven uh, patterns and uh, we have them not only in the Bible but also in the ancient Near Eastern world in a number of texts that we have so one of the things that 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 we consider then is whether we're talking about this and and the is the ancient Israelites would have been <clears throat> familiar with this pattern of sevens and six sevens and so on and so uh, one of the questions we have to ask is whether they would have understood then uh, this to be actually literal six days and then the seventh day or whether they were seeing oh well this is the regular six seven pattern 
and it's it's a literary way of shaping the story. It's kind of like you can tell the same story in different ways. So, like we have the four different gospels in the New Testament, and they're not all arranged the same. They they tell the truth each one, but they tell it and they shape it in such a way that makes particular points too in a certain way. And we have the same thing in the Old Testament in other places as well as in this place. And we even have, like Psalm 104, another um, account of God's creation that does the similar kinds of differences but with a lot of parallels. So the question becomes then, do we take these days as literal days or we do, do we take these as literary days? And uh, I've been moving myself in the direction of literary days uh, in the current time here. But it is framed as a week. Is that is that is that correct? So so you, your point here is is that we've got the picture of a week. Uh, obviously, we're connecting uh, this chapter to the idea of the Sabbath. Um, but but we also get a framing in such a way that it is somewhat distinct. You know, it's the same kind of discussion we, we run into in the New Testament. Uh, there's a very famous passage that's much discussed among uh, serious students of the Bible. It's uh, the rich man and Lazarus. And in this passage, there's a huge debate about whether we're dealing with a parable or whether we're dealing with an actual event. Mm -hmm. And uh, the discussion that comes into it has to do with, well, it begins like a parable. There was a certain man. And, uh, and so that's a, supposedly a tip-off. And then in the middle of the story, you get this communication between uh, heaven and hell, if I can say it that way. Um, it's technically not quite exactly what's happening in the <laughs> passage, but for most people get it. Um, and so you've got, uh, you've got the rich man in hell communicating with Abraham in heaven, and most people think that theologically there isn't kind of this cosmic internet thing going on, and so they recognize that's a figurative way of, of moving the story along and making, making the, the true points even about the afterlife, very true points about the afterlife that are in it. And so I look at that text and I go, well, is that a, a real event or is that a, a parable? And, and and the literary clues in it tell me it's parabolic. It, there are things happening within it that, that don't fit. And one of the discussions that, of course, happens in relationship to Genesis 1 is that, yes, we've got evening and morning, and we've got the figure and the picture and the framing of literal days, but we also don't have uh, the sun functioning until day four. And, uh, you know, we've got light and darkness, but we don't have the discussion of how that works until later on in the sequence. So, so there, the point here is, is that there are clues within the text that make this a legitimate conversation to have about what exactly is going on in the passage, just like the passage in Luke 16 with the rich man and Lazarus. Is that, is that part of what we're, you're trying to communicate here about the difficulty of getting your hands around what's going on in the passage? Yeah, and the reason it's it's done this way is because God does want to shape the story as a way of helping them understand they need to observe the Sabbath. And so the, the very nature of the way the story is laid out, I think, would be understood that way. It is, I think, uh, literary in that in that way, but it's telling us that God actually did create. He actually made this, uh, all, right, all that we're right in the middle of. And we are put in particular place within it. So the the point is then that Israel is supposed to live a pattern that reflects how this story is shaped so that they can have the kind of life that they should have coming out of slavery. Now even slaves and animals and so on get this day of rest. You know, uh, another thing to think about in relationship to the day of rest is, is is this idea, and that is that even though God rested in terms of the movement of shaping the creation and making the core creation the way that it is, he doesn't rest because he's the one who sustains the creation and keeps it going and operating. So, there, so we even have to think about how we think about the concept of rest when we're talking about the picture of the Sabbath, right? Yeah, because rest does not necessarily mean sleep. It, it, it means that you've ceased that, and I think really what's going on there on, on the seventh day is uh, it's already said everything's completed. I, I think the word Shabbat, the word for Sabbath uh, that's used there in chapter 2 verses 1 through 3 of Genesis uh, is the word that just means stop, means to cease. And so 
he's, he's finished the work, so he stops. And the work that we're talking about is just the core structure of, of, uh, of how can I say it, ordering the creation. That's what we're talking about. That's what we're talking about. Join us next week for part two of The Table Podcast. Dallas Theological Seminary. Teach truth, love well.